Um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome you all to the inaugural lecture on strategic gaming from the Center for Applied Strategic Learning here at the National Defense University. I'm truly excited that we're going to be joined today by Dr. Peter Perla speaking on the way of the war gamer. However, before Dr. Perla's presentation, I want to take a quick moment to introduce Castle and the lecture series. For those of you who may not be familiar with Castle's work, we serve as one of the U.S. Department of Defense's Centers for Gaming and Simulation here in Washington, D.C. Our varied audiences include NDU faculty and students, interagency community partners, the U.S. Congress, and numerous outreach stakeholders. This series really grew out of Castle's efforts to respond to two key needs in the gaming community that we had identified. The first is a need for more resources for gamers working to learn their craft. Too often, we've found that training and education have been restricted to home institutions and personal networks and mentors. In a time of shrinking resources, we wanted to make sure that there was an inexpensive option for new gamers to learn more about the craft from some of the best minds across the field. We're hoping that as the series continues, the library of recordings of the lectures will give new gamers tools to accelerate their education and to seek out new resources. The second desire was one that we heard from many of you who teach gaming, to be able to share your pedagogical methods and frameworks. We hope that a collection of sample lessons available as a rec recorded archive will forge connections between teachers at different institutions, will enrich lesson plans, and spark debate between practitioners and instructors to bring the field's best thinking more fully into the classroom. Before I hand the baton over to my director, Eric Conrad, for some brief opening remarks, to officially kick off the series. I want to go ahead and take a quick moment to recognize my co-host, Katie Dusek, and the other members of the CASEL team who helped make today's presentation possible. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Professor Eric Conrad to open the series. Sir? Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it and welcome, everybody. On behalf of Admiral Anne Rondeau, who is the president of the university, and Dr. Hans Benedite, who is our vice president for research and applied learning, I'm excited that we have gathered here today uh, virtually to kick this series off. This is a, a, an initiative that is designed to provide gamers with a, an enhanced understanding of the key concepts and methodologies that are part of our skill and trade craft. We are going to continue this on a regular basis. And the sessions are going to be archived on the CASEL website uh, that is maturing very rapidly. So I encourage all of you to stay tuned to where that is going. The, the intent is that there will be a game resource library available for common use. And the hope is that this is going to bring gaming knowledge and innovation out of isolation and is more accessible to the broader gaming community. And in that spirit, we're delighted to today to have somebody that is well known to all of you, so we're not going to go into lengthy introductions. Uh, Peter Perla, a colleague, a friend of long standing, delighted that you could help us initiate this, Peter, and over to you. Very well. Thanks, Eric. I uh, appreciate the honor that the castle does me by having me kick this series off. As you guys can tell from the title, I'm coming at the broader topic from my own particular perspective, that of the war gamer. I have been a box carrying member of that illustrious group for longer than I care to admit. Currently, I'm also a senior research scientist at CNA, the Navy's FFRDC. Although I've worked on a wide variety of operations research and analysis projects in my career. Lately, I've been heavily focused on my true passion, directing wargaming projects for the Army, the Marine Corps, and OSD. We wargamers are a peculiar lot. As the name implies, we thrive on gaming conflict situations. Indeed, we often joke with cause that any game becomes a war game when played by war gamers. Bye. For those of you who are not members of the war gaming community or who may just be approaching the outer edges of its gravitational field, what I plan to do today is give you some idea 
how to think about what war games are, some of the reasons why I think they and our proper use of them are important, and how, in a general sense, we create them. For those of you who consider yourselves already members of the wargaming community, I hope you will recognize some of yourself and your own work processes in what I describe. I look forward to hearing your reactions from both groups. If we have time, I will get on my favorite soapbox and talk briefly about what I call the cycle of research. Five. Our starting point, of course, has to be wargaming itself. What is it? Too often, people in this business use the term loosely, describe everything from the activity of thousands of real troops and vehicles maneuvering across hundreds of square miles, to the largely intellectual activity of a couple of guys crouched over a paper map and pushing around tiny cardboard squares. Going to be talking about here are real war games, not field exercises, analytical models, or computer simulations without players, what I call CAS whips. Real war games involve human beings making decisions and dealing with the consequences of those decisions, but not the action of actual forces. I want to emphasize that last point. Over the past few years, I've pulled back and forth over this notion ever since an Army officer argued to me that the exercises run in the field at the National Training Centers are war games, even though real forces are doing real things, because exercising the decision-making of the various levels of command central goal of the evolution. I was finally convinced to stick to my guns and reiterate my original definition after a discussion I had in the UK last summer with Professor Philip Sabin and several members of the UK defense community. The goal of the definition, after all, is precision effectiveness. Training exercises, including real forces, are a different tool. As with analysis, there is overlap between it and wargaming in some of their goals and methods. But we will only confuse ourselves. We call them both the same thing. Next slide. Let's take a closer look at the distinction between wargaming and analysis. Frequently, the two are confused sometimes resulting in a good war game being called bad analysis, and less frequently, to be sure, a good analysis being called a bad war game. Here is my definition of analysis in the national security context. Actually, it is a definition drawn from one of the four foundation documents of operation research and analysis. Morris and Kimball's Methods of Operations Research. You can see that the key words in this definition are the Gemini twin scientific quantitative. Slide. So from my perspective, wargaming is not really OR or analysis in the classic sense. Wargaming is not about science and numbers, but about decisions and players. Next slide. And players. This is one of my favorite wargaming pictures. It shows a team playing info chess, a very clever game created by the Aegis Corporation back in the 1990s to help teach basic concepts in information warfare. I was on the opposing team, led by John Warden of Desert Storm fame. We played these guys at a connections conference way too many years ago. We beat them in three or four moves, mainly because John played the players as well as the game. At least one of these guys 
was a serious rated chess player and expected that he would approach the situation from a chess player's perspective. John realized such an approach would be in serious trouble against an unconventional asymmetric attack. He was right. The game was probably a better representation of the cognitive aspects of asymmetric warfare any big-time simulation that today's community is trying to crank out. It was a simulation of the mental states of the key decision-makers, much more important than the technical specifications of the AK-47. These guys lost because they were playing by a set of principles derived from traditional chess. We won because John knew that the rules of the game had changed. Next slide. Because of their fundamental difference in philosophy and emphasis, despite surface similarities, it's clear that wargaming is not analysis. Nor is wargaming real. Sounds obvious, but I'm continually surprised at how can professionals can allow themselves to remember this fact when a game does not support their political position, but conveniently forget it when a game does seem to support them. The danger is especially real when the game is a good one, and the victim of the illusion has little or no experience of real warfare. War games are not duplicable in a very specific sense. Games can be good experimental test beds, but they are not Monte Carlo experiments. You cannot iterate a war game changing only the random numbers. The players will never be identical from one game to the next, even if they are the same persons. Once you have played the game, you have learned and experienced something that changes your state of nature, if you will. You can study a series of games using statistical and social science techniques, but only with great care and skepticism. As a result, war games are not universally ap applicable tools to solve all problems. War games are exercises in human behavior, human interaction, and human decision making. The interplay of those human decisions and actions and the myriad ways they may change the game universe makes it impossible for two games to be the same. War games are best used to explore the role and potential effects of human behavior and human decisions. Other tools, such as analysis, are better tuned to deal with the more technical aspects of reality. Next slide. War games may be our best hope of looking long enough and deeply enough into the uncertain future to help us prepare to encounter the black swans waiting for us there before they bite us in the fundament. Next slide. Some of you may have heard of or read the book The Black Swan. I wish we had time to delve into it in more detail today, but there are a couple of points from it I think are important to us wargamers. A black swan is the term applied to a highly improbable event that has the three characteristics listed on the slide. The term arises because of the historical fact that for centuries Europeans believed that by definition a swan was white, for the very simple reason that no one, of them anyway, had ever seen a black swan, until explorers discovered them in Australia. The black swan demonstrated the danger of one of the human race's major intellectual flaws. We are too ready to believe that absence of evidence is the same as evidence of absence. Not so much. The problem is, of course, that if you could predict a black swan, it would no longer be a black swan. 
So if we cannot predict them, we must prepare for them, not by being ready to deal with specifics, but by being ready to respond to the unexpected. And the best way to train your mind to handle such unexpected situations is to practice dealing with other unexpected situations. If you think that's a bit murky, try reading the book. But let's push on. Next slide. Taleb, the black swan's author, proposes that in order to deal with potential black swans, you have to be able to assess your state of knowledge without delusion. To me, that means you have to be sure of what you know and what you don't know. That's hard enough. Even more importantly and more difficult, you need to learn what you don't know you know. Finally, you have to try to discover what you don't know you don't know. It was this discussion, more than any other, I think, that convinced me that Taleb was a genius. Because nearly 20, century, 20 centuries, 20 years earlier, I had written that war games were the best way to learn what we don't know we don't know. Clearly, the man is brilliant. Next slide. Okay. So if I want to use war games to help me learn important things, how do I create them and make them work? I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing war game design and what I call the three archetypes. Next slide. Long ago, I characterized the key elements necessary to make a war game work in this way they should be pretty self-explanatory. Note, however, that I like to think of the objectives as part of the game itself, not something tacked on as an afterthought, or something articulated at the beginning of the process and promptly forgotten or ignored as we get down to the business of building the real game. Next slide. In practical terms, when we design one of these things we call a war game, what do we do? Like any game, we basically create a synthetic universe in which our players will have to live. They'll observe situations, process information, and make decisions within the constraints we have defined in that universe. Their decisions and actions will change the universe as the game progresses. I and my colleagues at CNA, including Mike Markowitz, Ed McGrady, and Al Nofi, have tried to characterize the key elements of this wargaming universe a couple of times now. That thinking has led to these six main components. I have arranged them to form the acronym TREADS, a term that fits the manly image of wargamers as tank lovers. You can also think of them in terms of related pairs, time and space, entities and relationships, activities and dynamics. Time and space characterize the physical dimensions in which the game takes place, not only that of the game world, but also of the real-world setting in which the players will experience that game world. Relationships exist among all the entities involved in the game, both the actual players and the game pieces, as it were, that they will manipulate during play. Finally, I use activities to describe what the players and game pieces do in the game, in dynamics to mean the changes their actions and interactions trigger in the game universe. That's a rough framework for the game part. But what about the war part? How can we articulate a framework for dealing, defining with the characteristics of real war, 
so that we can design our games to represent it effectively. Next slide. This is one admittedly simplified way of characterizing war. I have cribbed this structure from one of the pubs written by the Command and Control Research Program. Back in 2001, Dave Alberts and some of the analysts who support him published a book titled Understanding Information Age Warfare. This book proposed a construct that defined real war in terms of three domains, physical, informational, and cognitive. These domains represent, respectively, actual objective physical reality, the ways that we can sense, analyze, and report about that physical reality, and the ways that participants in a conflict perceive the physical reality in their own minds as communicated to them by sensing and understood by them through analysis. Next slide. So how do we go about translating our understanding and point of view about the real world of warfare into a game that will allow us to achieve what other, at whatever objectives we may have? I have identified these three distinct approaches to war game design. The first of these approaches we call the analyst. It is very similar to other techniques of modeling and simulation in the defense community. For this reason, it tends to dominate the view of most defense professionals when we talk about wargaming. It is important to remember, however, that the analyst approach is only one way to design war games and may not be the most appropriate approach for our current conditions. The artist approach worries less about modeling and simulation and more about storytelling. It strives to engage the players both intellectually and emotionally as any good movie or stage play might. The architect emphasizes what the players do focusing in on their decisions, and tailoring the game universe to bring the key decision points and options into sharper focus. Next slide. Rather than isolated techniques, I like to think of the analyst, artist, and architect as archetypes that are best envisioned as the X Y, and Z axes of normal three space. Most actual designs incorporate elements of all three approaches. You might then imagine placing any design within such a 3D grid. I will talk about each of these three archetypes in turn before wrapping up by getting on my soapbox. Next slide. Let's start with the analyst. In the analyst's approach to game design, the model, not the play, is the thing to catch the conscience of the king. The analyst designs games in much the same way any analyst would design a warfare model or simulation. The goal of the game is to produce a realistic model of the situation it represents. And the measure of that realism is how well the game's models reflect the real world, particularly the physical relationships and effects. The presumption is that if we get the physics right, somehow the decisions the players make will reflect the decisions that real world commanders might make in similar or analogous situations. Not surprisingly, perhaps, this is the dominant philosophy at the foundation of most 
DOD modeling, simulation, and gaming, at least as far as I have been able to see it. Hence the fetish for highly detailed simulation models, including the recent trend to building physics-like models to represent that most unphysics-like of elements, human behavior and attitudes. Next slide. As an example of the analyst approach, I will use the core elements of the Track Irregular Warfare Tactical War Game, or TWG for short. This game has several interconnected parts, but at its heart, there are two main pieces. The primary players use what is called the Task Event Outcome System, or TEO. This is a large spreadsheet model that requires the players to specify the tactics and tasking for their units, individual companies or platoons, on an hourly basis for a day or more at a time. The slide shows a subset of the possible tasks players may assign. I don't expect you to be able to read all of these, but you can see that the model is attempting to be comprehensive in defining the tasks the players can assign to their subordinate units and where and when they will undertake their activities. Next slide. The second core element of the TWG is the Cultural Geography Model, or CG. CG is used to generate changes to the population's attitudes and behavior as a result of the events players generate in the TEO. Because the whole point of the TWG is to represent the effectiveness of military operations in a population-centered conflict, CG is, in a sense, the ultimate combat results table for the game. It determines whether one side or the other is progressing in achieving their goals. Next slide. I believe that analyst type models, simulations, and games can be very useful, and they certainly have their place. But for me, to use games to learn what we don't know we know and what we don't know we don't know, we need to move beyond traditional simulations. The kinds of simulation games that are the forte of the analyst game designer do their best to model the future by modeling the past. They too often leave little room for the unpredictable because so much of what happens must already reside in the underlying models, even in models like the CG. The other two design approaches, those of the artist and the architect, may help us go beyond those limitations. Next slide. The artist uses detailed facts about the environment and effects of actions as the basis for constructing his world and lets the players freely connect to and create from those facts. But he also grounds their activities in a context he himself creates to reflect his own perspective on or point of view about reality. Playing such a game demands more time than playing other types of games and creates more engagement. The dynamics of the game itself emphasize its effect on the players, particularly on their emotions. It is less concerned with creating an objectively realistic experience 
whose outcome, in terms of what actually happened in the game, may persuade some external audience to believe that the game says something valid about the real world. It's focused on its own players primarily. Next slide. Typically, at least in the realizations of this approach that I have seen and been involved in, most of them designed by my colleague Ed McGrady, the game is really about human relationships, either interpersonal relationships or organizationally based relationships. The design of the game tries to play on the tensions that exist between the players in order to bring out the real and potential conflicts that might exist, not only between players or teams competing against each other, but also within those individuals and teams. The point of view that the designer uses as the core of the game must be based on a careful organizational analysis of the issues that players need to work through. Next slide. Let's consider a fictional example. Suppose we are tasked to design a game to practice an organization's emergency response procedures. The orthodox simulation style approach to the task might focus on the obvious problem, in this case, procedures for doing emergency response, but without taking into account how organizational relationships might affect the problem. While researching the situation, the artist discovers that some response plans call for pooling laboratory scientists away from their normal research to support the emergency response group. The group responsible for the laboratory would experience significant disruption to its operations if its people were pulled away. To protect themselves from this problem, the lab group has established formal and informal rules and policies to limit such cross-tasking. These policies might seriously impede emergency response operations. So the artist designs the game to break down the organizational barriers separating the two groups by placing representatives of both groups in the position of having to coordinate their sharing of personnel. Such a design would show the research Okay, we appear to have lost Dr. Perla temporarily. I'm going to step off the line and see if I can't get back in contact with him. And apologies for the technical delay, and hopefully we will be back in just one moment. Where would you like me to pick up? Um, I, you want to just pick up right where on the slide that you dropped out during? Um, slide 22. That's the artist example? Exactly. Okay. Apologies for the technical problems, and hopefully that will be the last of them. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll pick up in the middle of this discussion. So the artist designs the game to break down the organizational barriers <coughs> separating the two groups by placing representatives of both groups in the position of having to coordinate their sharing of personnel. Such a design would show the research branch the serious consequences of its not cooperating with the emergency response branch. It would also show the emergency response branch the disruptions caused by unnecessary or excessive requests for support. This type of design drives the scenario away from a simple emergency response game to one that simulates the activities of both the research and response groups so that each shows the other why its positions are important. 
the more mechanistic approaches to game design sometimes do not reflect on the fact that internal organizational conflicts and limitations may exist for reasons that are valid if you take a perspective other than the one that seems the most obvious starting point for the design. A good artist designer looks at the problem from different perspectives and attempts to develop a design that will allow the participants to identify and work in a cooperative solution space. Next slide. The architect, on the other hand, tries to distill the details of the real world into a form that is more readily accessible to the players for making decisions. The decisions that the designer foresees or foreordains as being critical to the players as they live out the story of the game. The dynamics of the game center around those decision points, and analyzing the game depends on understanding why the players make the decisions they do in the context of the real world situation represented in the game. Playing a game of this type typically requires less time and less intellectual and emotional engagement than playing an artist's game based on similar subject matter. But it does so at the potentially high cost of reducing the ability of the players to range freely in their actions. Next slide. Typically, at least in the games I have designed, the guts of an architect's game are less explicitly about human relationships and more explicitly about human decision-making processes. The design of the game tries to distill organizational and institutional processes into a relatively small number of critical decision points. The designer's point of view lies primarily in the choices he makes about how to represent the physical and decision-making environment the players must live in and act upon. Specific issues that the players must deal with should arise almost organically from their decision processes and are less often specifically built into the game design than they are in the artist's approach. Next slide. As an example, let me briefly describe the game that Phil Hausman, Mike Markowitz, and I designed as part of Track's overall IW war game. Our game is called the Operational Rack Wraparound, or OWA. Rather than a very detailed computer depiction of a single district, which is what the TEO game represents, the OWA is a board game which looks at the rest of the districts in Helmand Province. But it does so at a much higher level of abstraction. Here is the map board. Instead of a detailed hex map used by the TEO, OWA uses only a few large areas and circles, which we call neighborhoods. Blue units, represented by company-level counters, deploy in either a kinetic or non-kinetic mode into these neighborhoods. Red units, such as leaders, fighters of various types, IEDs, or others, are also deployed into those neighborhoods but typically are unknown to blue, represented by having their playing pieces inverted. Interactions with red are resolved by matching up individual pieces and drawing a card that gives results in terms of damage to the combatants, possible civilian casualties, and perhaps some intelligence. The damage given on these cards is based on an analysis of actual combat outcomes in Afghanistan. 
Obviously, that description is only scratching the surface of the game, but I hope it gives you a le sense of the level of abstraction of our distillation of brigade level operations. Next slide. In addition to the military activity, of course, the OWA also needs to represent the non-kinetic aspects of the campaign. We do this by using a display for the four districts, which represents several of the key dynamics of population <coughs> interactions, but again, in an abstract manner. Key leaders, which are named individuals represented by counters, are placed in the boxes to the left as they become identified. Players can interact with those key leaders to affect population attitudes and possibly acquire intelligence advantages. The series of tracks represents the various infrastructure and services available in the districts. Player actions can increase or decrease the status of those elements, as well as the degree to which the population takes advantage of the service each side provides. All of those elements of the OWA are translated into terms that the CG model understands and integrated into the effects of the TEO play to adjust population attitudes and behaviors across the province. Thus, the IW Tactical War Game, including its operational wraparound, is an interesting and, in my experience, unique marriage of analyst and architect designed war games in a single package. Next slide. And that leads me right to my favorite soapbox. Next slide. Classical analysis forms a foundation of understanding built on real world data and objective analysis of it. War games help us to explore how human decisions can react to the real world and in reacting, change it. Exercises can help us better understand how real people and real systems work as they try to carry out the decisions made by real commanders, but in a controlled and, yes, artificial environment. Only reality, seen through the prism of observation and history, can show us the range of potential outcomes of all those interacting elements. Only by using all our tools in a self-reinforcing cycle of research can we hope to learn more wisely from the past, operate more effectively in the present, and prepare more prudently for the future. Last slide. Returning in the end to our tool of the day, wargaming, we must again integrate the three dimensions of design to bring them into better balance. The analyst games that have dominated DOD wargaming since the Cold War grew out of the analytical belief that you can model, predict, and explain more about the world than you can ever hope to do, at least for the purposes of exploring the really hard questions posed by an uncertain future potentially hiding a flock of ugly black birds. To cut through the spurious details of such models, and focus our limited span of attention and understanding on our best guess, because that's really all it can be, about the truly key factors. We must draw on the distillation process of the architect. But if we really want players to think about ways to prepare to face the unknown unknowns, we have to free them to go where they will. 
so we must incorporate elements of the artist's approach into whatever we do. There are no sure things in the real world, except, as Ben Franklin told us, death and taxes. But I am convinced that DOD must push forward revolutionary applications of all our approaches to wargaming in partnership with improved analysis techniques if we are to prepare to confront the challenges of the 21st century with some hope of avoiding disaster and instead profiting from the positive opportunities that may await us. Now, over to you. I'll entertain your comments and questions. Ellie? Okay, great. Now, hopefully the technological gods have already exacted their vengeance on us and the Q&A functionality will work. Hold on one moment, please. All right, great. We're now in a Q&A session. So if you hit star six on your phone, you'll be placed in a queue to ask Dr. Perla a question or make a comment that he can respond to. So if you can go ahead, if you're interested, and hit star six now. All right, and I'll take the first questioner. The phone will notify you if you're, it is your turn to speak. Yes, this is Eric Walders from Marine Corps Intelligence Schools. It sounds like, Peter, that uh, the design challenge for those of us who are trying to implement artist and architect uh, uh, approaches is bringing about environments that will generate those black swans. And of course, that's difficult if you, by definition, don't know what those black swans are going to be. Are there any techniques that you can recommend to create those second and third order unforeseen effects? Thank you very much. Sure, Eric. Uh, the only thing that I see as a possible black swan generator is other people. So you need competitive play. You, you need to use real people playing real, real parts in the game. Uh, sometimes you can do that in the classic way, just having opposing sides. Sometimes uh, you can use a technique where you have multiple teams playing the same game and switching back and forth between one side and the other, for example. But, but since we don't have any um, sort of window into future black swans, the only place I can find them is through other people. Okay? All right. On to the next question. All right. I'm getting a blank here, Ellie. Can you hear me? I am. I'm hearing you. So I think we just had a blank question slot. Let me try again. Hey, Peter. This is uh, Phil. As you know, I'm quite close to the uh, tactical war game, and I found it interesting that you pointed out that it's a combination of architect and analyst styles. So. Thinking along those lines, uh, in your experience, have you seen any war games that are a combination of the artist and architect style? And what do you think that might look like and what that might be useful for? Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, Ed, Ed McGrady and I have collaborated on a number of, of games in the recent past and uh, since Ed is sort of the prototypical artist, and I consider myself the prototypical architect, we've done a, a couple of things along those lines. The, the key element, uh, probably for those of you familiar with commercial gaming, the way to think about the artist is as a role-playing game. And the way to think about the architect is uh, like a board game or even a miniatures game. So the combination is a game in which the participants really absorb a role. They're playing a, a definite role in the game as a decision maker. And the game itself is trying to generate in them the sense of, I'm this decision maker and I've got to make this decision. Um, one of my... my uh, early experiences of something along those lines was actually a computer game of World War II submarine operations. 
in which I was playing the captain of a U.S. submarine out in the Pacific. And I was lining up a shot on a target when suddenly the computer started pinging sonar at me. And my immediate gut reaction was, damn it. Uh, so there are ways you can combine the role-playing aspect of the artist and the decision-making aspect of the artist, architect, in a, in, to create a powerful experience. Okay? Thanks. Okay. On to the next question. Okay, hi, um, Peter. It's Phil Sabin from London. Uh, I'm glad you said that analysts, architects, and um, uh, artists are uh, not exclusive because I think most games have elements of most of those. Um, it seems to me there's something that unites war games rather than divides them, which is all of them are essentially about dilemmas and trade-offs. If there's something where the way ahead is clear, um, then it's not really a war game. The game is about making choices under uncertainty, under limited resources or whatever, and all of these various things combine within that. Would you agree that that dilemma and trade-off is one of the central elements of any kind of war game? I think that's an excellent observation. In fact, I plan to steal that as soon as I can. Um, yeah, the the whole question of, in fact, dilemmas and trade-offs are underlying to most games, I think. Uh, they certainly are underlying the the decision making processes in board games war games all right with that we'll move on to the next question hey dr perla commander dave vitalo at castle I, it's less a question about gaming but more about dod's hang-ups on the analyst type game do you think that's because of so many of their decisions really aren't are, are driven by budgetary decisions so that you know, most, most of the folks that are in the Pentagon are, are not there making war fighting decisions. They're there making budgetary decisions. Is, do you think that's the reason? Uh, I've actually I've done some thinking about this. Uh, I've been, since I got, in, got started thinking about the Black Swan, I, I actually started doing some research into the, the origins of OR. And my, my take on a lot of this is that the, the whole system – which derives still from from the McNamara era of systems analysis, um, was was built to create a consensus, to come up with a, a shared language, uh, the systems analysis paradigm, to get people to agree on a decision on the basis of some common and quantitative approach in many ways. It was really an economics-based system rather than quantitative per se. Um, so I think that that's really the source of a lot of this, that it stems from the, the entire underlying economic-based philosophy of systems analysis. And at some point, I'd like to have a chance to, to think through that process more and compare it to some of the other uh, operations research and wargaming-based ways of thinking and how those can combine together in this cycle of research as well. But I think that's probably an accurate assessment of why the, the heavy detailed models uh, are, play such a big role because the real decisions in the real world that take on life and death tend to be second and third order when you're in the Pentagon and you're living in that fantasy land. Okay, thanks. All right, Dr. Perla, we're just about at noon now. Do you want to take a few more questions, or do you need to get off the line and continue on? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll take a few more. I think I can stay for another five, ten minutes. Okay, great. Move on to the next questioner then. Hey, hey Peter, it's Michael Peck. Uh, question for you on the um, on some of the uh, different methods of wargaming there. And it struck me that if you're looking at human relationships and focusing on that sort of those processes, aren't you back to the kind of back to square one in terms of the subjectivity issue? In other words, is the underlying psychology, um, is the underlying sort of human dynamics, aren't you back to sort of the, the issues of subjectivity and is one person looking at it one way and somebody else considers it to be uh, – uh, invalid. Uh, how do you how do you address those issues? Well, that that 
then it also depends on, I guess, what you're trying to to achieve. And that's why I said the when you do a, when you look at the 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 heavily artist game, shall we say? Since, as Phil points out, no game is ever one or the other. Um, the the artist focus tends to be on affecting the people that are actually playing the game. And so the validity of the game depends on how well the players themselves accept the validity of their experience. And so that's that's part of the experience of the game itself. Can I convince somebody who didn't play in the game that my particular uh, perspective on the game is right? That's a question of persuasion as opposed to proof. Um, the psychology is fundamental to the entire process, I think. But I haven't really thought in enough depth about that particular aspect of the problem to say much more than that. If I just want to ask a quick follow-up, then it sounds like what we're talking is sort of a model, of very specific games for, tailored to specific groups, then. It sounds like it would be more difficult to come up with a general game design. Well, I'm not so sure it's modeled to specific groups as it is modeled to specific types of organizational problems or processes. A lot of the same techniques can be used with different groups depending on where their their tension points are. Okay, great. You want to take one last question, Dr. Perla? Okay. Okay. Uh, with luck, I'm not on mute anymore. Uh, uh, this is Ralph Chatham. Uh, hey, Ralph. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, oh, I am coming through. I was struck by your uh, notion of uh, the uh, decrease in reality by the artist thing and an example of a case that took uh, my Star Wars program very far from reality but had value for players and relationships. Uh, it was a way to take a small unit and, and have them understand how to deal with the unexpected and operate together. Uh, General Paul Gorman sat in the back of a meeting and, and asked why we cared about making the tactical simulation so accurate. How about just playing a fantasy game on off Thursdays? And so we did. We called it Gorman's Gambit, and, and, and a platoon played its other, half the platoon played against the other half at Neverwinter Nights. And the lessons were fascinating uh, and sometimes surreal. The, the medic said, I don't got healing spells, all I've got is resurrection. But they did show everybody in the team how they responded to the unexpected, who was innovative, who was dogged, who were flywheels. And, uh, and it, like also many other kinds of war games, uh, we ran out of cash before we followed up. But uh, the notion of separating yourself from reality to get more of the emotion and the interpersonal behaviors is one that uh, uh, works even in that extreme. Yeah, in fact, like Matt Caffrey will remember, um, I believe, back in the early days of Connections, uh, I think even Dave Deptula uh, somehow mentioned this at one of the one of the Connections conferences, that there there weren't there were no really good games to explore technology development in sort of air power environments. And as I'll recall, uh, one of the games that they used at uh, Command and Staff College, or whatever whatever that is there at Maxwell, I've forgotten the exact name, um, they, they used a science fiction game that allowed you to develop your, the technologies of your spacecraft, that sort of thing. And, um, and that proved to be able to give the players the insights into the entire development of technology and deployment of technology and use of technologies to conduct operations that they were looking for without having to use a real-world environment. Um, I'm not so and that's sure especially true, as you point out, when you're really interested in psychology. Uh, sometimes, yeah, in I, fact... I think when you go into science fiction, you, you, you very often uh, create technologies that are impossible, and most people don't understand that. But to understand how a person behaves, how he responds to unexpected, that's something that, that is real, or, or at least so I think. Right. I, I agree with that completely. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> 
Well, with that, I'd like to add my thanks to Dr. Perla. I appreciate him stepping up to do what the fir I hope will be the first of many of these presentations. As I mentioned at the beginning, this has been recorded and will be posted to the CASEL website, so you'll be able to access it um, at a later date if you want to come back to it and think more about the thoughts we've had. I want to thank all of you for joining the discussion. This has been a really fantastic